London Heathrow, handling 200,000 passengers and over 1,300 flights every day, is the busiest airport in Britain and one of the busiest in the world. In this video, we'll take a look behind the scenes at some of the people and machines that keep this airport running at near maximum capacity every day of the year. Plus, listen for details of how you can win a trip to go airside at Heathrow. Over 80 airlines operate out of Heathrow, flying to over 200 destinations in 85 countries worldwide. With so many flights, passengers and cargo, yet only two runways, how do they keep things running smoothly? I was fortunate enough to receive an invitation from Heathrow Airport to go and look at their operations, that is, to go backstage as it were at Heathrow and see how the airport functions and some of the things that they have to deal with. Now this is fascinating for me as, as an aviation fan, it's such a dream come true to be able to go to an airport as important as Heathrow and see firsthand the people, the technology and the machines that keep it operating. My journey started off by being taken to the operations centre. Uh, this is a building on the north side of the airfield. And in this building is a room which houses the operations team. I wasn't allowed to film inside this room for security reasons, but I can describe it to you. They have a view out onto the airfield and on the other walls are very large monitors filled with security cameras, systems updates, metrics, all kinds of information. In the middle of the room sits the operations manager. He was the guy that basically explained what is going on. In this room, he is sat and next to him is the UK border force. Behind him is what they call the flow operations team. They monitor the cameras which will be looking at things like passenger security queues, airport lounges, security doors, baggage areas, the local roads, arrivals and departures, M25 motorway, you name it, they've got the information in front of them and they're looking for problems, they're looking for queues and they will move staff from one side of the airfield to another in order to sort out a problem. They even have a team near the operations manager from the Met Office. They are not content with just having information from the Met Office, they have people from the Met Office who will feed them information about the local weather and how it's likely to affect flights coming in and out of Heathrow. What I did find intriguing was sat opposite the operations manager are two people who monitor social media. It turns out that social media is often the best place to get information of anything that might be about to impact operations at Heathrow. This could be anything from an accident on the M25 to a full-blown terrorist attack somewhere in London. The operations manager joked that when Heathrow sneezes, Europe catches a cold. So any problem at Heathrow will cause delays or cancellations right across Europe. The idea of the operations team is to predict things that may happen and to react quickly to issues that do in order to minimize disruptions not just at Heathrow but across Europe. My tour then moved on to the baggage system at Heathrow. You may have often wondered like I do, when you take your bag and you put it on the conveyor belt at the check-in desk, what actually happens to it? How does it suddenly appear at the airport in the other country that you then flew to? I was taken on a tour of Terminal 3's baggage area and spoke to the baggage operations coordinator and he described how the baggage operation works. Once your bag leaves the check-in desk, it's taken on a conveyor belt into T3's link bridge. This brings it up into a sorter, where it then goes into screening and then goes back into the sorter. If the flight is due to go out in the next 90 minutes or so, it will then go straight to actuals to be loaded into one of the ULDs, the Universal Loading Devices, or BIN for short. We'll talk more about that later. Otherwise, it'll go into the bag store. Now the bag store at T3 is the largest in Heathrow. Essentially the bag store is a bit like a library. It contains row upon row of shelving and between each row of shelving is a robotic arm that can move along, up or down. And what it can basically do is store a bag into the, into the bag store or retrieve one. Every bag travels around on a, on a tray and the trays move around the bag store on conveyor belts. Now the machines in between the storage areas can retrieve bags from the store and then put them onto the conveyor belt where they will be routed to the destination. Conversely, if something is being stored into the bag store, it can pull it from the conveyor belt, move it to a particular position on a shelf and store it for later retrieval. Now behind all of this is a computer system which knows the weight and location of every bag in the system. 
The bag store itself has the capacity to store 4,500 bags. Now, in order to stop the bag store from getting too full, what the system will do is it will build flights as early as it can, up to as many as five hours ahead of a flight. Upstairs in the bag store is where these earlier flights are built. There are three building stations called RTTs that are operated by two staff. So what happens is one of the operators will log into the system, punch in the flight number, and the system will then decide which bags it is going to send down. It will have already calculated ahead of time the weight of the bags. It will start by sending the heaviest bags first. Within a few minutes, these bags will arrive on the conveyor belt to a loading arm. The loading arm is essentially designed to take away the manual labor of loading bags into a ULD or a bin. So as you grab the loading arm, if you move it up or down, left or right, forward or backwards, it will move with you with virtually no effort. You can then operate the conveyor belt to bring the bag right to the end and load it into the ULD. Now the ULDs are something that you may have seen before. They're the things that go up the uh, ramp when they're loading into the aircraft. They're called universal loading devices, but they're known as bins. Now, if the three RTTs are too busy or perhaps there's a shortage of staff, then there are two robots. These robots are called Ronnie and Reggie and they're almost fully automated. It takes one person to operate the robot. A supervisor simply logs in, punches in the flight number and the system does the rest. The robot arm will load the ULD itself. It's slower than loading with people but ultimately it takes no manual effort to do it. Once the ULDs are loaded, the system keeps track of how heavy each bin is, and they're then sent off to another storage area to await retrieval to go onto the aircraft. Now downstairs in the baggage area is a very busy place. This contains what's known as the laterals. The laterals are where a large proportion of bins are actually loaded. These will be things with flights where the baggage is coming in and the flight is going out within 90 minutes. The tolerances are very tight in this area, which is why as much as possible is done ahead of time upstairs rather than overloading the laterals unnecessarily. Now for connecting flights, bags will have to be moved from one terminal to another. So how is this done? Well, Heathrow has an underground belt system. It doesn't fully connect all the terminals together, but for example, a bag can go from T3 to T5 by using the underground belt system. Such bags are individually loaded onto trays which have wheels. Now these trays will travel along what is almost like a roller coaster system that travels at about 30 miles per hour, and it's all driven by magnetic force. Such underground belt systems are expensive to make, and as I said, they're not all connected. So for example, if a connecting flight arrives at T4 and wants to connect to T5, this is the longest distance across Heathrow. This is literally one side to the other. What happens is the bag comes off the tarmac at T4 and goes into the baggage system. It will then go into a cart, through a tunnel, and it will appear at T1 baggage system. It then tips out of the conveyor, it's then fed into the internal terminal operations where they'll load it into a van, drive it over to T3, where it's then fed into the tunnel at T3 and it then carries on onto the belt system to go to T5. That operation will take approximately 35 to 40 minutes. Hence, if it's a 90 minute connecting flight, it's fairly comfortable. But if that flight should come in late, well, there may possibly be problems. In such circumstances where baggage can't make it from one terminal to another on time, the airline will have to make a decision about whether to wait for that baggage or not. It really depends on how much baggage is being delayed. Because if the airline waits too long, they'll suffer penalties from Heathrow. And if they don't wait, then they're going to have to explain to the passengers why their baggage has not arrived at its destination, which could also induce fees. Such decisions are often made based on how many bags are late and whose fault it is that they're late. Now this baggage system can handle most baggage, that is ordinary shaped baggage, but if you've got cargo that is what they call out of gauge, it has to go by a different route. It takes a journey of its own where it will be scanned and handled manually. If it's very big and it can't fit through a standard x-ray machine, then it'll have to go through a different process where it goes to a security point where the handler, the passenger, and someone from security will have to be present while the item is swabbed, screened, and taken through a different process. Also, if the proposed new runway at Heathrow does get the go-ahead, it's highly likely that a new conveyor belt system will be implemented underground to connect the new terminal to the existing terminal infrastructure. 
How many members of the public can say that they've walked on top of Terminal 2 at Heathrow? Well, that's exactly what I got to do. We went through a series of security doors and we made our way on top of the shops. So there I was, on top of the shops, looking down at the passengers in the departure lounge. We then went up some more ascending stairs and finally appeared on top of T2. Now we had to be careful where we walked because we had to walk along these specific gangways. But when we were up there, we got such a view. We looked down on the stands of the aircraft that were being prepared. We could see the ground crew loading and unloading, the aircraft taxiing. And then in the distance, you could just see the aircraft taking off for landing. What an absolutely cool experience that was. But the roof of Terminal 2 was not the highest vantage point that we'd get to see that day. The next stop was the control tower. Situated almost dead centre of the airfield lies the Heathrow Air Traffic Control Tower. Standing 87 metres tall, it was built in 2006 and it gives a full 360 degree view of the airfield to the controllers who work in there. When it was constructed, it wasn't allowed to disrupt the day-to-day -day running of the airport and that meant it had to be brought in in prefabricated sections. First, the five-storey control room which weighed 900 tonnes and 27 metres high had to be moved two kilometres across the airfield. When it was put in place, they then inserted 12 metre sections underneath until it reached its full height. Once we got up there, oh my god the views are just unbelievable, these controllers are so lucky to be working up there. As you might expect, you can just see everything up there, you can see both runways, you can see approaches, landings, you can see taxiing aircraft, it's just a phenomenal view. Whilst up in the control tower, I spoke to the Nats representative who explained the information visible on the screens which the controllers use. The first screen he taught me through shows the layout of Heathrow and the positions of the moving aircraft. The blue aircraft are the departures 27 right on this occasion, and the brown aircraft are the landing aircraft on 27 left. Unlike most international airports around the world, Heathrow does not separate international and domestic traffic, so any landing aircraft could be going to any terminal. This departures and arrival screen is not generally used by controllers on a good visibility day because they can see the aircraft coming and going. At night, however, and during poor visibility conditions, the screen is used, and if the controllers had to evacuate to the emergency control room, then this screen would be absolutely essential. The next screen he showed me is the replacement for what controllers used to use when they used to write aircraft down on pieces of paper, on strips of paper, put them on wooden blocks and move the blocks around. This is the computerized equivalent of it and is now in use in most Nats towers. Again, blue aircraft are departures and brown aircraft are landing. Now each section shows the aircraft call sign, the type, the destination. The destination is important as you need to know what SID that the aircraft is taking. The queue for the departures is on the top right hand screen. As they line up to take off, the controller moves the strip to underneath the runway designator. Similarly, with arriving aircraft, there's a queue for them, and the controller will move an aircraft underneath the runway designator once it's clear to land. These runway designation areas are the real protected zones. Nothing except aircraft should be in this zone. They're the most important area simply because that's where serious collisions can happen. On the lower right of the screen, you can actually see two aircraft that are in the protected zone. One is cleared for departure and the other one is cleared to line up. The one that's lining up will be cleared for departure as soon as the current departure has actually left. The controllers will generally deal with around 40 to 45 departures and the same number of arrivals per hour. Arrivals are separated by a minimum of two and a half miles. Departures, on the other hand, are separated by time normally a minimum of 60 seconds. However, vortex wake separations also have to be taken into account for any aircraft flying the same route as the previous departure. So separation times will then be increased depending on the aircraft type involved. Now the order for optimal departure has already been worked out earlier in the queue. Usually this is planned by controllers, but can also be done by the computer systems. The aim is to bunch up the largest aircraft in order to minimize the separation. What you don't want is a heavy aircraft followed by a small aircraft followed by a heavy aircraft and so on. And finally, controllers are very well paid, but only 1% of applicants actually make it through the selection process. That's just how good they have to be. The Nats rep also explained that European airspace is incredibly fragmented for such a relatively small geographic area. 
One of the things they're working on is called the Single European Sky Initiative, and that aims to reduce that fragmentation. He also described how they're looking at innovative solutions in cooperation with local residents in order to reduce noise levels in areas surrounding airports such as Heathrow by leveraging the modern aircraft navigation and flight systems, which are incredibly accurate. Now, as you may know, Heathrow is looking to gain approval for a third runway, so noise concerns are top of the list of things to be addressed. Currently, Heathrow uses SIDs and STARS. A SID is a standard instrument departure, and a STAR is a standard terminal arrival route. And what these do is they guide the aircraft in and out of Heathrow. It also switches runways halfway through the day. All these things combined help to manage traffic coming in and out of Heathrow, but it also means that in the areas surrounding Heathrow, you've not got traffic flying overhead all day long. One of the solutions they're looking at is called loft hatches, which is essentially navigation points in the sky that connect different airspaces. And this would allow the controllers greater freedom to spread the aircraft geographically, while still allowing them to connect to the standard airways. It's these kind of solutions which Nats looks at, and it's only made possible because of modern navigation and computerization. He also painted a picture of the future. One day, Heathrow Tower may not actually contain people, but just be instead filled with cameras looking across the airport. Controllers would likely sit in the basement or even off-site and be surrounded by augmented reality screens, showing a mix of high-definition live camera footage overlaid with computerized information. Now, this may sound like science fiction, but it's already been trialed at NET. London City Airport is having one of these digital towers, as they're called, installed and the controllers sit 80 miles away at the Nats HQ in Swanwick. Currently, cameras can only be used for support, not control, and the controllers must still have visibility of the aircraft. But it probably won't always be this way. For the final part of the day, we were taken in a minibus across the airfield. We drove alongside aircraft as they were taxiing, the guy driving has been working at Heathrow for over 20 years and he has permissions to drive all over the airfield. He took us to one of the closed off vacation points on runway 09 left and this is sandwiched between the runway and the main taxiway. And as we got outside of the van, it just became apparent how close we now were to these aircraft. On the larger aircraft, it almost felt like you could just reach up and touch the wingtips and as they went past, you would get the roar and the whine of the turbofan engines. I've never stood so close to a taxiing airliner before. It felt so special. Minutes later, the aircraft that had just taxied by, you'd see them right down at the bottom end of the airfield, making the turn, and then they'd line up onto the runway and then you'd hear the engine spooling up and slowly this thing would start to come towards me the engine noise gradually picking up in volume until it became deafening and then the rotation began usually just in front of me like tens of meters away and then the wheels would lift the tarmac what an absolute sight that was we stayed here for about 20 minutes watching aircraft after aircraft taxi and take off of course I couldn't help but be excited when a 777 lined up. The unmistakable sound of the GE90 engine spooling up is just so special. I don't think I've ever seen so many 777s in one place. And as for Dreamliners, Heathrow is just filled with them. There's certainly a lot of long-haul aircraft flying out of Heathrow, so you do get some pretty large aircraft going past. The 747s are fairly common. There's a few A330s, A340s, and then the big daddy of them all, the A380. We drove over to a Airbus A380 which was parked up at a stand. I got out of the van and just looked up at the monster that was in front of me. It's kind of hard to describe how big an A380 is. You can read all the statistics you want about football field sizes, but until you actually stand right next to it, the engine, it's just one of the engines itself, is colossal. Absolute beautiful piece of engineering. And then you walk underneath and the sheer size of the wheels, the size of the undercarriage, you look up and you see this monstrous machinery that is holding up the weight of this aircraft. The nose wheel section, again, it's such a huge piece of engineering. It's a fantastic machine and just a tribute to what we can do in aviation now. 
And finally, to close the day out, we got taken over to the ILS system and we stood there as aircraft came in overhead and landed on the runway. On the outside of the perimeter fence, you could see plane spotters looking at us with envious eyes. The position that we had to just be right underneath these aircraft as they were coming into land. Wonderful. As I left Heathrow, I realized that I just had a probably once in a lifetime opportunity. I sat in TGI Fridays eating my Jack Daniels smoking ribs and went over what had happened during the day. So much had gone on. One day isn't enough at Heathrow. It's such a big and busy place. I hope you have enjoyed this little look inside of Heathrow and what goes on there. It goes without saying that I would like to extend my thanks to the Heathrow team who invited me over and organized this trip, the operations team, Nats and the ground crew, and everyone I spoke to who was so friendly and informative. They really do a phenomenal and important job down there, and it gave me a real insight to the work they do every day. If you would like to win an airside tour at Heathrow similar to the one I had, then you can enter a competition which is running alongside the ITV TV series Heathrow, Britain's Busiest Airport. This six episode TV series broadcasts every Wednesday at 8pm in the UK and is also available on catch up at the ITV hub. If you want to enter the competition, then you need to click the link in my video description. That will take you to the TV series page where you can enter. I hope you enjoyed the video guys, until the next one, take care, happy flying.